Um, this is the summer, and this is the first class for uh, for the cultural psychology class. Uh, so the first chapter is about uh, what is cultural psychology? Maybe. There we go. People from different cultures live their lives differently. They speak different languages. People have different customs. They eat different foods. They have different religious beliefs. They have different child rearing practices. Much about a person's lifestyle can be predicted just by knowing his or her culture. Psychological processes are shaped by experience, and this is one of the reasons why uh, a lot of people have complained about Western psychology, uh, because it doesn't fit everybody around the world. Well, of course it doesn't, because uh, it is uh, very culturally centered, uh, and it deals with primarily with uh, Western culture. And this is one of the reasons why um, we are looking to uh, create a Navajo psychology uh, master's degree because it will deal with uh, counseling um, uh, Diné people as compared to the Western psychology. Now the question is, and uh, you know I hate to ask this question, but the qu the real question is how traditional are uh, Diné people, and can Western psychology actually work with select uh, Diné people or with actually a relatively large percentage? You know this is one of the things. That we have to think about, and this is one of the things that we need to talk about. Uh, this is uh, this is also an area that's very sensitive to a lot of people, um, and uh, so, so this is is just one of the areas that we need to think about. And you, as students, of course, um, are are we teaching you something that you're never going to be able to use, uh, or are we teaching you something that uh, is uh, innovative and something that uh, we should be using in the future? To what extent should uh, ways of thinking look similar around the world because people share a universal brain? To what extent should people around the world look different because they have di divergent experiences? And the answer is we do look a lot different. We wear different clothes. Uh, we have different hairstyles. Uh, we even um, create our faces differently. Some people tattoo themselves. Some people scar themselves. Some people... Uh, 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 use uh, uh, jewelry, uh, and, and other people don't. So uh, these are all things that have to do with uh, experiences, and these are all things that have to do with uh, what culture you come from. Culture is any kind of information that is acquired from other members of one's species uh, through social learning that is capable of affecting an individual's behavior. Any kind of idea, any kind of belief, any kind of technology, any kind, any kind of habit, any kind of practice. And of course, this is a picture of Sai's uh, Gangnam style. Um, I've been to Korea. Uh, I've been to the Gangnam area of Korea. Uh, it is the cool place in Korea. And they're the ones that dictate what kind of fashions we're going to be seeing in, in Seoul and and in Korea, and, and therefore maybe, potentially, if it's picked up around by other cultures around the world. That's what Gangnam is. Culture indicates a particular group of individuals. Uh, cultures are people who uh, are existing within some kind of shared context. And of course, this is the Korean style. Uh, this is uh, uh, Korean uh, culture. Uh, this is Sai, of course. And there's Sai again doing his horse riding dance. As weird as that seems, I don't know. It kind of, it kind of, <laughs> people enjoyed his, his uh, video. I think it's the most viewed video in the history of YouTube. It's, it has over a billion views. Culture can be used in a global context. Uh, Western culture refers to people clustered from the Northern area of Europe. And so when we're talking about uh, the northern area of Europe, what just what are we talking about? We're talking about the United Kingdom. A lot of people, one of the, the reasons that so many people immigrated out of, uh, uh, traveled away from England, was because they had something called primogeniture. Primogeniture uh, meant that if you had five boys in your family, 
then only the eldest would uh, inherit. Uh, the other four had to find something else to do. And a lot of these individuals, since they couldn't uh, own any of the land that their, their parents owned, uh, decided that they would move someplace else. And they came to Canada, they went to Australia, uh, they came to the Americas, traveled all over the world. A lot of people went to India, uh, into Africa, of course. Uh, and the, one of the reasons is because they couldn't inherit to any of the land in, uh, in England. And, of course, they spread all over the place. And this is the United Kingdom. This is Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and, and uh, Great Britain. The Netherlands is, is another part of the Western culture. That's Holland. Uh, France is another part of Western culture. Germany. That's Neuschwanstein. That's, uh, that's the castle that, uh, uh, that Disney's, uh, the Disneyland's castle is, is uh, modeled after. Uh, countries with a strong English heritage, the United States, uh, Australia, and Canada, of course, uh, because they were primarily settled by uh, the English. Now, the reality is that more Germans came to the United States than English. Uh, but, of course, it was spread out over time. The English are the ones that started the colony. Uh, so England has a, a strong, or had a strong grip on, uh, on American culture. Of course, they did settle in Canada, along with the French, and Australia, of course, was settled by the English as well. Jewish culture, while well, 32% of the Jewish people in the world actually live in Israel, 32%, 36% actually live in the United States. So there are more Jewish people in the United States than there are, uh, than, uh, than there are in, in uh, Israel. Urban cultures, these are subcultures within uh, other cultures. Or these are subcultures. The Jewish culture is a subculture. Urban culture is another one. You don't represent this, and neither do I, unless you live in Phoenix. Uh, I wouldn't, I don't know, Flagstaff, I guess you could say, is an urban is part of, an, of the urban culture. Los Angeles, uh, Denver, uh, Chicago, uh, St. Louis, Kansas City, Atlanta, uh, Boston, New York, that's all urban culture. Uh, gay lesbian culture is another subculture within the, the uh, Western culture. Uh, high uh, socioeconomic status culture. Uh, if you've never been around these people, it, they're 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 different. Uh, they're paranoid that people want to take all their things. Uh, they lock themselves behind gates. Um, very interesting uh, group of people. The high socioeconomic status culture. This is one of the reasons why I was really shocked that uh, Donald Trump was able to uh, be elected president because Donald Trump re represents these people. He doesn't represent anybody else. So what was the first thing he did? He, he uh, gave rich people a big tax break. <laughs> okay. Uh, veg uh, vegetarian culture is another subculture within the uh, Western culture. Uh, millennial culture. Uh, you guys who are millennials, I'm a baby boomer. Uh, but you guys who are millennials, uh, I guess, uh, Toy Story, according to this, it's Toy Story, Britney Spears with her snake, uh, Will Smith, uh, and Batman. I'm not sure who the guy with the suspenders is. Uh, the Harvard culture is another subculture within, uh, within the Western culture. Um, it is very much alive. If you've ever been around anybody from Harvard, Harvard, uh, they... Uh, assume that uh, whatever they think is is accurate and whatever you think uh, if it's not the same as what they think it is uh, not accurate uh, only good the only good information comes out of Harvard it's what they think of course there's the Yale culture as well but it's not not nearly as strong as the Harvard culture uh, Mac user culture uh, I'm a Mac user I've, I've only owned uh, uh, Mac and Apple computers uh, so <laughs> I'm a Mac user, um, and it, it um, really bothers me when I have to use a, uh, a PC uh, because there's a lot of things that are different. It's a little bit easier on a Mac, and of course I know, understand Macs. And now I guess the IT department's going to be 
tracing max or something. I haven't quite figured out what they're talking about yet. Uh, the Trekkie culture, of course, is a subculture within the other cultures within our culture. There we go. Live long and prosper. Uh, everybody's giving the Spock salute. Members of subcultures may not live near each other, but their members live in a shared context, communicate with each other, they maintain norms that distinguish them from other groups, and they have some common practices and idea ideas. These people are bronies. They are my little pony people. They call themselves bronies. Everybody has a favorite uh, my little pony, evidently. Uh, it's either the pale blue one, the yellow one, the pink one, the purple one, or the green one, I guess. And these people are known as bronies. And I don't even remember My Little Pony that, that well, evidently. They were really popular, and they still are to some extent, I guess. Anyway, that's, that's a subculture. Each person has their own unique history of individual experiences that has shaped their views. All these individual uh, differences lead some people to reflexively embrace certain cultural messages, staunchly uh, react to the to other cultural messages and largely ignore some other cultural messages. And the reason I have a picture uh, of an individual in Iraq, I believe, uh, is because those individuals that uh, served in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, you know, these individuals have their own idea of the world, and because of their their experience in in that war. In either of those wars, uh, because they were deployed to one place or the other, and some people were deployed to both uh, both areas, in Afghanistan and Iraq. Of course, they're going to have different ideas about what uh, how, how we should run things. Um, my uh, era was the Vietnam uh, Vietnam War era. I uh, joined the military in 1971, so I'm a I'm a uh, veteran of uh, the Vietnam era. Um, and that, that changes the way that I have seen things because I, I, I was part of that whole political uh, miasma going on uh, with the, and the whole anti-communist movement uh, that was taking place uh, in, uh, around the world. I was actually in a uh, terrorist attack in uh, Germany when I was stationed in Germany. Uh, so these, all these things change the way that you see things. Okay, now we're going to talk about something really controversial, and, and uh, if this offends you, I apologize, but uh, we're talking about cultural psychology. I know one of the things I want you to understand is that uh, not everything is, can, is like what you think it is. <laughs> there are some places that do things completely differently, and this is, uh, this is, one, of those, uh, this is one of those areas. The Sambia are a tribe in Papua New Guinea, and this is Papua New Guinea right here. This chunk right here, there's Australia, Indonesia, uh, actually Irian Jaya is on the other side. Uh, this is Irian Jaya and this is Papua New Guinea. Anyway, the Sambia are a tribe in Papua New Guinea, as you can see. They look different uh, than uh, the people uh, of the United States primarily. Uh, because of the constant warfare around them, they have culturally ingrained initiation for boys to transform into men. So this is how you become a man if you are a Sambia. Uh, the Sambia believe that femaleness is an innate natural essence. Maleness must be cultivated. They feel that because men come from women that they have been tainted, they've been contaminated by this feminineness. And uh, males need to become uh, masculine. They need to become warriors uh, in order to, to uh, protect uh, the, uh, the the village. Boys are seen as existing in a female world and are contaminated by their mother's wombs. It is very important to rid boys of feminine habits and transform them into brave men. And of course, this is what brave men do. Uh, they go out and they uh, confront the enemy. Initiation practices are used to transform boys into men, uh, piercing the septum of the nose, uh, thrashing boys with sticks. Initiation also includes older men giving jurungdu uh, to the boys. This is achieved through the boys performing oral sex on the men. Semen is seen as physical basis of jurungdu. Males are seen as incapable of producing semen without the initiation. In other words, they can't reproduce unless they've gone through this, this process, this jurungdu. 
Throughout one's life, a male engages in ingestion of semen from around ages 7 to 15, receiving fellatio uh, to impart semen at, a, at age 15, heterosexual contact with wife after age 17, and some homosexual contact still. Sambian males thus go through homosexual, bisexual, and heterosexual phases throughout their lives. Sexuality, seen as a core identity in Western cultures, is more dynamic in Sambian, uh, Sambian society, where it is seen as the only way to, uh, to maintain your maleness. Uh, now, the, uh, an interesting thing about this is that, uh, so the Sambia do this, they, they uh, perform uh, oral sex on, uh, on each other, uh, the males do. Um, however, there is a tribe uh, very close to them that they fight all the time, uh, there's another uh, group, uh, and they use uh, anal intercourse in order to, to impart the jurungdu uh, to the uh, to the young men, so that they can, uh, uh, so that they will become men. Of course, any of the all of this, uh, all of this, if if it were anybody was doing this in the United States, it would be seen as pedophilia, um, and it would be uh, it would be uh, uh, condemned. But of course, in their culture, that's their culture. We can't tell them that they're wrong, of course. Uh, just like you can't tell anybody that their culture is incorrect. Uh, that's just the way they do things in uh, the Sambia tribe of Papua New Guinea. In all cultures, people speak a language between 10 and 70 phonemes. In all cultures, people smile when they are happy. In all cultures, people are, have a word for the color black. In all cultures, people are disgusted at the idea of incest between parents and children. In all cultures, people understand the number two. Some languages do not have a word for the color blue. People in some cultures are disgusted at the idea of incest between cousins, whereas people in other cultures are not. Of course, this is one of the reasons for your clan system is to keep people away from, uh, to, to keep incest from happening. Uh, but in some cultures, um, marriage between first cousins is, is very common. As a matter of fact, uh, this was uh, the common practice in the royal, in the monarchies of Europe, uh, where first cousins married each other uh, relatively frequently. A female student uh, going out for coffee might mean uh, for that student a chance to quench her thirst, of course, a demonstration that she has quit her diet, uh, an effort to wake herself up uh, so that she can study, uh, an opportunity to pursue a romantic partner. All of these things are possibilities just because she's going out for coffee. In some other cultural contexts, women going to a coffee shop on her own is not seen as appropriate. Uh, people in her culture do not strive for ideal body weight. Uh, it is considered sinful to seek artificial stimulants to obtain energy. Romantic relationships are typically arranged by family members. So whereas in the United States, this happens on a daily, sometimes a multiple times a day basis. Uh, just ask uh, Professor Barber. He's, he's a big coffee drinker. Uh, he loves his coffee. Uh, he's, he's got a, a cup on his desk that is the size of a bucket. Uh, but in other cultures, this would be considered uh, inappropriate, uh, totally inappropriate. There's nothing about uh, going out for coffee that is ex would be acceptable in that culture. Small mammals and birds that depend on spatial memory for food storage uh, have unusually large volumes in their hippocampi relative to other species. The longer a London cab driver has been driving a cab, the larger his posterior hippocampus becomes because he has to memorize all of the uh, roads in London in order to be a cab driver. And they test them, and they do not allow them to become cab drivers unless they can pass the test, which means they have to memorize every street in London. Now, the odd thing is that uh, uh, London was built in concentric circles. Uh, so if you've ever been in a town where all of a sudden the uh, the, the name of the street changed, this happened in England uh, almost from one block to the next. Uh, so there's that they had to uh, to uh, they have to uh, 
uh, memorize the entire map of London. The nature of the brain is not fixed uh, from birth, but rather changes in the response to certain experiences. And because cultures provide people with particular sets of experiences on a daily basis, we can see how cultural influences could change their brain. Although people around the world are born with relatively the same brains, with time they come to have different brains by the way of their different cultural experiences. So our brains are not the same. Uh, our culture has changed it. Uh, I, I talk about being a, a Hoosier farm boy from, from time to time. Um, and uh, my military experience, 30 years in the military and teaching college classes, uh, if I go home, since my cultural experiences have been very vastly different from my, uh, from my brothers, who's, who pretty much just stayed in Indiana all of their lives, um, we actually, our brains are probably structured very much differently now. Humans are so embedded in their cultural worlds that they are always behaving as cultural actors, and their thoughts are always sustained by the meanings that are derived by their cultures. There are no occasions when people step outside of their cultural meaning systems and start to think instead like the universal human. People's thoughts are forever bound in their own cultural meaning system. And this is one of the reasons why you should embrace your culture. There's no way to step outside your culture. I'm from Indiana. There's nothing I can do about that. I will always be from Indiana. Um, and growing up in, in Indiana, this is one of the reasons why I really appreciate farmland and I, I also appreciate green grass uh, because that's what I grew up with. Uh, so when I was living <clears throat> in Salee uh, and traveling to Chin Lee for my groceries or traveling to Gallup for my groceries, it was very alien to me. And the reason it was alien is because I'm, I'm a lowlander. I'm a flatlander. <laughs> I, I appreciate flat. I appreciate uh, I, I appreciate I appreciate uh, grass growing or even weeds growing. Uh, so that's uh, and and driving around uh, in the, in the desert like atmosphere of Chin Li uh, or around Gallup uh, is was very alien to me. It was a very very alien environment. Uh, the mountains, you know, I, there's no mountains. There's not even barely any hills in Indiana. Uh, let alone mountains. So mountains don't really impress me all that much. Uh, I was talking to uh, to Dr. Robinson about this. Uh, he he just loves it. He 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 thinks Salem's the most beautiful place he's ever been, and and he said, uh, "How can you not like love the mountains?" And I told him it, they're just big rocks. When I was a kid, I had to clear clear rocks out of our our. Uh, out of our fields, uh, it, it seemed like we were growing rocks. Uh, it was because we were turning over the soil. So we're, we're pulling rocks up every year. And we'd have to go in and, and get those rocks out of there because, you know, that'll mess up your planter while you're, or disc, it'll mess up your disc. So we'd have to, we'd have to clean all that out. <clears throat> clean out all the rocks. So as far as I was concerned, Mountains are just bigger rocks. Many cultural psychologists, but, you know, that's part of your culture, and, and you can see that as, as gorgeous or beautiful, and that's fine because, you know, that's where you, you come from. I just don't come from the same place. Many cultural psychologists would agree, argue that culture cannot be separated from the mind because culture and mind make each other up. So the question is, can you change your culture? Is it possible for me to live in Saley for the rest of my life and fall in love with it, just like Dr. Uh, Dr. Robinson. Dr. Robinson's actually from up around Cleveland, uh, which, is, which is fairly flat, and it's uh, very humid almost all the time. And now he's in Salee, uh, where it's summertime especially is, is very dry. Um, can you change your culture? And the answer is sure you can. Uh, all you have to do is spend a, a an inordinate amount of time there, and uh, your culture uh, will be uh, altered. Psychological universals of a cognitive tool does not exist in all cultures. It reflects an absence of universality and is said to be non-universal. Uh, the skateboard, for example, that's the reason I put that picture there. 
uh, skateboards not uh, it's non-universal it's not the same uh, people around the world everybody doesn't have a state a skateboard an existential universal exists in multiple cult cultures although the phenomenon is not necessarily used to solve the same problem nor is it equally accessible across cultures and what are we talking about sweethearts okay uh, in the 50s, 70s, and 90s, and things have changed, of course. Uh, functional universal exists in multiple cultures. Is It's used uh, to solve the same problems across cultures, yet are more accessible to people from one culture than another. And this is a perfect example. Uh, uh, Chen Di wears one of these things. Uh, he's, chi he's Chinese, and he uh, is from Asia somewhere. I think he's from, from China. Uh, anyway, this is they wear these in, in China. We use these in the United States as well. I guess you guys probably don't use them so far south, but uh, people in Montana, people in Canada, of course, uh, you see people on, on uh, uh, snowmobiles uh, will wear uh, a, uh, an outfit like this. Uh, so this is very common. Uh, balaclava uh, is, a, uh, is a wool mask that looks like this. So it's, it's a functional universal. An accessibility universal exists in all cultures. It is used to solve the same problem across, across cultures and is accessible to the same degree across cultures. This is a bathroom in China. And as you can see, here's the stool. This is a bidet. Uh, and this is the shower. And as you can see, there's nothing around the shower uh, to keep the moisture from, uh, from getting to the rest of the... Uh, the bathroom and the reason this they do this is because once they take a shower they just wipe the whole bathroom down and now everything is clean I'm not sure what they do with the towels uh, it's it's very controlled I mean the moisture is controlled because as you can see uh, they're just squirting uh, uh, various parts of themselves uh, this is a seat to sit down on this is uh, a handhold to, hand, to, to hold on to while you're cleaning whatever part of your body you want. This is a handhold to get up off the bidet. There's another one over here to get up off the, the, uh, the toilet. Very much different from the United States. And the interesting thing is if you, if you travel around the world, then you, what you find is that uh, the toilets uh, that we have in the United States aren't the same toilets that they have. The one in Japanese is really kind of curious. The Japanese toilet is really kind of curious, um, and the one in Germany I thought was was kind of kind of fascinating. Um, and if you ever want to talk about toilets, I can tell you about toilets around the world. The vast majority of psychological uh, studies uh, have thus far been largely limited to expl explorations of the minds of people living in Western, educated, industrialized. Rich and democratic societies, weird societies. A recent analysis of the top six journals and six subdisciplines of psychology found that 68% were from the United States. They were American. 96% came from Western industrialized countries, uh, Germany, England, uh, France, uh, Sweden does a lot of research. 70% uh, of all psychology study participants are undergraduate students. In other words, when we're looking, when we're doing research, one of one of the groups that we have access to readily without having to pay pay them money is uh, is students. So uh, when when we actually do all of the this research, and this is one of the reasons why I want you to look at research. Um, skeptically, I, I want you to see what the population is that they that they uh, they were they were testing, they were surveying. Because if it was college students, you know, college students are what uh, eighteen to, to twenty two years old. Um, do they, are they representative of everybody in the United States or everybody in any country? And the answer is nah, probably not. North Americans appear to be more fascinated with psychological questions than those from much of the rest of the world. Many universities not in North America don't even offer psychology as a topic of study. The first school of psychology in Japanese universities was established in 2000. 
And of course, psychology in the United States has been around for a really long period of time. This is, uh, uh, was, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, KTU, this is a, uh, a university in, um, in Canada. Uh, they established their psychology, philosophy and psychology department in 1922. So, you know. Uh, Harvard, uh, Harvard School of Psychology is in the Department of Philosophy uh, in, in a lot of colleges around the United States. Um, the uh, psychology was part of the, the philosophy department and then eventually it branched off. It's still, it is still in the Department of Philosophy uh, at Harvard. Uh, Indiana University, the fifth floor is, is where all of the, uh, the fifth floor of the library is where the uh, uh, psychology uh, journals are housed, and it's also the floor where all of the philosophy uh, journals are are housed, and it's a, it's known as a philosophy philosophy floor. Uh, for the longest time, psychology was not considered a separate idea beyond philosophy, and that's why when I received my PhD. I am a doctor of philosophy, not a doctor of psychology. Uh, however, Professor Barber is working on his doctorate, and he will have a site, a site D. In other words, he will have a doctor of psychology, uh, which is primarily a counseling degree. But uh, my my degree is a degree in philosophy, uh, with a with an emphasis on psychology. Some people in the diversity uh, movement maintain a colorblind or color uh, culture blind approach to looking at people. People are the same wherever you go. The hope is that people will interact without focusing on someone's ethnic background. Uh, and of course, the concept is post race, uh, so that we won't see each other as different. We see each other as the same. Attending to and respecting uh, group differences is frequently called the multicultural approach. So this approach is known as the diversity approach, this colorblind approach. And the, the uh, approach where you um, uh, accept people's cultures as different and accept people as different different and in groups, this is known as a multicultural approach. The rationale behind this approach is that people really do identify with their groups, and most group identities are far more meaningful than the kind that can be artificially created in the lab. People are especially likely to identify with their groups if their groups are smaller than other groups or are disadvantaged in some way. Minority groups tend to greatly value their group identities, and they often respond quite negatively to efforts by the majority group members to ignore what makes them distinctive. This, uh, this was actually a movement in the United States. Uh, when people were coming, when masses of immigrants were coming in uh, at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, uh, one of the things that they tried to do was to educate everybody. They tried to assimilate everybody into this nebulous concept of the American culture, uh, what did they call it, the, the melting pot. Uh, they were trying to, to tell people that uh, you're American now, you're not, you're not Greek, you're not uh, Hungarian, uh, you're not Italian, uh, you need to, to become an American and not uh, act like you're different than everybody else. Uh, un unfortunately, the boarding schools uh, got caught up in, in the same educational structure uh, that was taking place, this this need to assimilate. Uh, so they tried to destroy everybody's culture. They were not only trying to destroy uh, the uh, indigenous people, of course, they, their culture, but they were also trying to destroy all the people immigrating into the United States. Now, the interesting thing is that 60% of the people that immigrated to the United States, and there was this huge mass of people coming into the United States at this time, and one of the reasons is, was because we needed workers for, for factories. Uh, we were building all these factories and we needed people to do the, the work for cheap. Uh, so we we're bringing all these people in from Ireland and, and France and, and uh, Germany and Italy, uh, especially Germany. Uh, Germany's, well, there, were, there was a lot of stuff going on in, in Europe at the time and from Eastern Europe. And what we were trying to do, we were trying to make them not 
act like people from where they were from. We were trying to get them to be good Americans by educating them to be Americans rather than to be other other people. And this, of course, was the, the diversity movement. This, of course, was the assimilation movement. And, of course, the uh, unfortunately, the uh, uh, the boarding schools got, got wrapped up in this whole idea that everybody needed to be American. We needed this huge melting pot. Uh, now, the sad part was, of course, that, yeah, sure, you can. You can pretend that you're making everybody the same, but uh, one of the most important things to a lot of people were uh, skin tone. Uh, the darker you were, the less likely you were to be accepted into this uh, this melting pot concept of, of of who everybody was. Anyway, okay, so that's the so we've had these movements going on all the time. Um, and, and a lot of this was led by, uh, people who were, uh, of English descent. But the reality is more people immigrated to the United States from Germany than, uh, immigrated to the United States from England. Uh, just, that's, you know, just, that's a point of fact, uh, nothing to, to, uh, to argue about. So, you know, um, and one of these, one of the things that you need to think about, and, and you can forget this if you like, uh, one of the things you need to think about is that, uh, if, uh, the, the most traumatic thing that ever happened to the Diné people, uh, was the long walk, uh, that happened in 1864. You, then you went back in 1868, you went back to, uh, the, uh, between the, the, uh, four sacred mountains, uh, that happened in, in 1864 to 1868. Uh, the vast majority of white people that came into the United States came in after that, came in after the Civil War, 60% uh, of all the white people. So the vast majority of, of individuals that you see as white, the vast majority of them weren't even in the United States when, when this traumatic thing happened. Uh, you, you know, and... and you you can think of all white people as, as this nebulous mass of people and they they do all these horrible ugly things uh, but the reality is a lot of them were peasants themselves over in Europe somewhere uh, being treated fairly poorly and that's the reason they immigrated to the United States uh, but they weren't anywhere they weren't uh, e even uh, in this hemisphere uh, when uh, when all the ugly stuff took place. Now that's not true of my ancestry. My ancestry has been here for 400 years. So if you want to blame somebody, I guess you can blame me. But uh, the vast majority of white people had, hadn't come to the United States by by the by 1868. Efforts to downplay uh, group differences may come across as suggesting that minority members would be accepted as long as they shed their distinctive cultural identities and acted like those in the majority culture. Studies done looking at corporations found that the more multicultural and less colorblind the attitudes of the white employees, the more minority employees were engaged in their work. So it's much better to recognize people for who they are rather than try to pretend that everybody's the same. In the same study that researchers discovered that minority employees have their have more trust in and comfort with a country, a company that offers multicultural messages rather than one that offers colorblind messages, especially when the company has only a few minority members. So we need to re recognize diversity. We need to recognize differences. Ethnocentrism is the is judging people from other cultures by the standards of one's own culture. Our cultures ultimately socialize us to be ethnocentric because we are socialized to value normative cultural behaviors. Uh, so if you see somebody as different, uh, then uh, you're being ethnocentric. If you see different as negative, then you're being ethnocentric. In the 1950s, with the advance in brain imaging techniques, psychology entered the cognitive revolution as researchers rejected the tenets of Freud, Skinner, Watson, and Rogers and began focusing on the meaning that people created through their encounters with the world. But one of the fathers of the cognitive revolution, Jerome Bruner, 
uh, argued that the proponents of the cognitive revolution had become distracted from its initial vision by becoming more concerned with computer metaphors for understanding the functioning of the mind. Meaning became replaced with information. Meaning making became replaced with info information processing. Bruner argued that cultural psychology has to pick up the torch that was originally carried by early proponents of the cognitive revolution and has again addressed how people derive meaning from their environments. And that is the end of chapter one. Why is this important? Uh, the cognitive movement was really kind of interesting. And it's uh, the cognitive uh, movement is, is also trying to take over psychology. Uh, they pretend that, uh, well, they don't pretend. Uh, they argue that uh, Freud, Skinner, Watson, and Rogers, all these people need to be looked at historically, but not to uh, be studied uh, very closely. Um, cognitive psychology um, looks at the structure of things and, and tries to determine why people think the way that they think. And it makes a lot of sense, but discarding all, all other people's ideas just doesn't make a lot of sense. And that's what Bruner, that's what, uh, Bruner was saying. And that's him when he graduated from college. Let's go on to the chapter two. Let me get rid of this. And there's chapter two. We're going to look at Elvis. Culture and human nature. Humans are quite particular about whom they choose to imitate. Humans are said to have prestige bias. They're especially concerned with detecting who has prestige. That is, they seek others who's, who have skills and are respected by others, and they try to imitate what these individuals are doing. And there's everybody trying to look like Dolly Parton, or there's four people anyway, uh, trying to look as close as they can to Dolly Parton. And there we go, all the Elvises. All right, they dress like Elvis. They try to talk like Elvis. They cut their hair like Elvis. There you go. That's the Elvises. Imitating prestigious others is a very efficient way of cultural learning. Individuals are more likely to learn successfully if they target those people who are especially talented. Identifying signs of prestige and then imitating people who displayed those signs are skills that were likely selected for in the course of human evolution. Our ancestors who did this were more likely to acquire the, higher, uh, the highly useful cultural knowledge that gave them a survival advantage compared with those who did not. Humans have what is known as a theory of mind. The theory of mind means that people understand that others have minds that are different from their own, and thus that other people have perspectives and intentions that are different from their own. Imitative learning is where the learner copies precisely what they think the model is, is trying to do. Emulative learning is where the learner is focused on the environmental events that are involved. The emulative learner is only focused on the events that happen around the model, not what the model intends to accomplish. In emulative learning, you learn one task but can't use that knowledge in any other context. Human cultural learning is cumulative. Cultural information grows in complexity and often in utility over time. This is called the ratchet effect. Like a ratchet, it always moves forward and is not allowed to slip backward. Cultural information can continue to accumulate without losing the earlier information. To have cum cumulative cultural evolution, you need creative invention, reliable and faithful social transmission. A high fidelity social transmission requires accurate imitative learning and sophisticated communication. And all of this took place uh, among humans uh, because we learned to write and we could uh, hand down the ideas that we had in the past to the future. No species but humans have shown these capacities for any of this. Uh, so other animals, don't, they, they can't communicate. Um, as readily as humans can. And it is our communication that has allowed us to evolve to the point where, that we have evolved to. Here I am, I'm looking at uh, this PowerPoint, 
you know, all this electronic stuff. It's all written down. Uh, I have pictures to show you. Uh, and, and the reality is that uh, this is part of the human evolution, is the fact that I have all of this written down. Now, the interesting part is, when I first started teaching, there were no PowerPoints. <laughs> uh, there were barely computers. <laughs> So when I first started lecturing, I used to write out all my lectures, and of course, I, I would read them, read my lecture notes to my students, and they would take notes. Uh, now we don't have to do any of that stuff. Now I can just show you what I'm talking about. I don't have to, to uh, uh, create um, a, a picture in your mind. I can actually show you a picture of what I'm talking about. And of course, all of this has evolved. I remember when I first started using PowerPoints, uh, we were using floppy disks, um, and you couldn't put any pictures on it uh, because if the more pictures you put on it, uh, the more um, uh, uh, that you would uh, take away from. Uh, I mean, there was only a certain amount of memory that you could use, so you couldn't put any pictures on it, and that, that was really frustrating for me. But at least you know, you, I could I could put my lecture notes on. On my PowerPoint slides, uh, and then of course, as things as memory imp in improved, uh, I can remember the first jump drive I ever had. Uh, this lady had <laughs> well, lent me her jump drive because I was putting everything on discs. This is a hard disk at this point, uh, but she was she lent me her her uh, her jump drive. Um, what would we call it? Thumb drive. I think thumb drive is another name for it. Anyway, I it, I was just amazed because it was so much easier than using the uh, using the uh, discs. Oh, anyway, now we've evolved to this and all this stuff. My my computer has so much memory. I can I can download all of my my powerpoints. The larger the group of people, the better the cultural information can be maintained and improved upon. You're more likely to encounter a successful model to copy from out of a larger group than out of a smaller group. There will be more innovations that come from a larger group than from a smaller group. So a larger group will be more likely to have at least one person stumble on a good idea. The more people, the more likely that somebody will stumble on the good idea. Therefore, China, should, with 1.8 billion people, China should be the most innovative place in the world because it has so many people. Looking at the Polynesians settling the South Pacific, the islands with the largest populations at the time of the first contact had far more different kinds of tools than the islands with the smallest populations. Bigger populations allowed for more rapid spread of cultural innovations. However, sometimes the ratchet slips and the population will lose ideas. This happened with the aboriginal population that inhabited Tasmania from the Australian mainland. Australia is about the same size as the United States, strangely enough. I know it doesn't seem that big, but it, it's actually that large. This is Tasmania, this, this chunk of land right down here. Uh, evidently, it was difficult to get from uh, the mainland to uh, Tasmania. Uh, but they were able to do that, and they brought their, their tools with them. And then, because the population was so small, they lost some of the, the innovations that they had had on the mainland. When Europeans initially arrived in Tasmania, they found scattered foraging bands of humans utilizing the simplest technology. Archaeological digs have shown that the technology seen in their past was far more advanced than what was demonstrated in their current technology. So they had lost it. Comparing the Tasmanian Aborigines with those across the, the uh, Bass Strait in Australia, the T Tasmanians maintained a toolkit of only 24 items, whereas the Australians maintained a toolkit of hundreds of items. The Tasmanians had lost bone tools, they'd lost cold weather clothing, they'd lost fish hooks, they'd lost boomerangs. Other groups where the ratchet seems to have slipped include the Melanesians of the Taurus Islands north of Australia, the reclusive Siriano uh, of Bolivia, the reclusive Paraha 
of Brazil. Humans are a cultural species that exists within worlds consisting of cultural information that has accumulated over history. Cultural ideas greatly influence the ways that we live our lives, determining much of what we do on a daily basis. We are all born into rich cultural worlds and we are constantly learning and being influenced by the shared ideas that make up our culture. Our brain size is determined by the encephalization quotient, the ratio of the brain weight of an animal to that of predicted for a comparable animal of the same body size. For humans, it is 4.6, or that we have a four to five times larger brain than another mammal of our size. Only the tiny but big brain shrew has a higher ratio than humans, and they maintain a brain that accounts for 10% of their body weight. Our brains consume about 16% of our basal metabolism, even though our brains only represent 2% of our body weight. The brain of the average mammal only consumes 3% of their basal metabolism. The brain of the marsupial only consumes 1% of their basal metabolism. In order to maintain the massive human brain, the trade-off was shrinkage in other areas. The chimpanzee's muscles are 27% larger than humans, so don't get in a wrestling match with a chimpanzee. They're really strong. Our guts, our stomach, and small and large intestines are 60% smaller than that of the chimpanzee. So what did we trade off uh, to, to have big brains? We traded off muscle and we traded off gut sizes. But chimpanzees can eat things that we can eat. And of course we can eat, uh, we, and what we have had to do is learn how to uh, eat other foods it, and it gets interesting after this. One reason humans are able to reduce their digestive needs is because we are able to learn to do some of our digestion outside our bodies. We learn to cook our food. No other animal cooks their food. We are the only animal that does. Cooking substantially increases the amount of energy that can be extracted from food. It denatures protein, it gelatinizes starch. It makes all foods softer and easier to digest, thus requiring less energy. And this is one of the reasons why we don't need the gut that the uh, chimpanzee has. Because of cooking, humans are able to consume foods that cannot be eaten raw. This reduced the amount of chewing necessary to consume food, uh, reducing the amount of muscle required in the human jaw. It also changed the shape of our teeth. This is the teeth of an ape. You can see this is the ripping and tearing portion of their teeth, and this is the, the gnawing part. We don't have that huge, uh, those uh, sharp front incisors. Uh, aren't, they're not nearly as sharp. We just bite things off. Now, the reason, we, the reason we're able to do this is because our food is softer than theirs. The average human spends one hour chewing their food a day. The average chimpanzee spends six hours chewing their food. By cooking our food, we, are, we were able to evolve a much smaller digestive tract, which freed up much energy to be used by our brains. Many primates eat a lot of fruit. There are good reasons to eat fruit. Fruit is rich in vitamins, carbohydrates, and calories and fruits tend to be available in concentrated patches. To live off of a diet of fruit, you need to keep in mind where the various fruit trees are located and when they would likely be bearing ripe fruit. Perhaps the greater need for a good memory and a big brain was triggered by the need to remember fruit locations. And these are apples in a tree that's lost all of its leaves, but it still has fruit. This is in the autumn. Those primates that had better skills at remembering where the fruit was, was would have been more likely to eat well and have survive, surviving offspring than those who were stumbling about aimlessly trying to find ripe pawpaws. And these are what pawpaws look like. <laughs> uh, way down yonder in the pawpaw patch. Picking up pawpaws, put them in your pocket. 
Uh, I don't know if you've ever eaten a pawpaw. It kind of tastes like a, a banana. And they're slimy. Um, these aren't the pawpaws that we had uh, in Indiana. A number of primate species rely on uh, food sources that require a fair bit of ingenuity to access them. Uh, some primates' food sources include nuts and seeds encased in hard shells, tubers that need to be dug up, termites that need to be fished out of termite mounds. Extractive food sources such as uh, the ones just mentioned are often worth pursuing because they are rich in protein and energy. Those primates who were able to extract nutritious foods were more likely to survive and produce viable offspring. Most primates live in complex social groups, maintaining clear power hierarchies, allowing them to form various re relationships and alliances. Conflicts as well as cooperation, nepotism, and reciprocity are common in these groups. This is a group of people called the Bushmen of, uh, of the Kalahari Desert. These are Bushmen. Humphrey and Dunbar have hypothesized that it was the necessity to navigate through the intricate and elaborate webs of social relationships, the need to attract a mate, secure resources, and protect themselves and their offspring that led to the development of the big brain. These are people that are networking and they are creating a uh, social network, social relationships. They're eating at a candlelight supper. Dunbar and anal excuse me, Dan Dunbar analyzed the relationship between neocortex ratio and average group size and estimated that the average size of the human ancestral population was about 147.8. Looking at sub uh, subsistence societies still that still exist, uh, Dunbar discovered that the average uh, clan size was about 148.4. In 2011, Facebook did a survey of its accounts and found that the average number of friends that people had was between 120 and 130. The same year, Twitter analyzed their accounts and discovered that people could maintain between 100 and 200 interactions. Any groups that are larger than 150 become too unwieldy uh, to manage without some institutional structure, yet smaller groups lose their advantages of large numbers. Although primates are highly social, so, so 150 seems to be the number that we're looking at here. And what we're talking about is, you know, um, uh, ex formal uh, extended uh, family groups. How many friends do you have? Well, if you counted all the people that you know, uh, potentially, and you've lived in the same place for, for an extended length of time, of course, I, I've moved all my life, uh, but uh, if you have lived in the same place uh, for most of your life, you probably can count about 150 people that you know and interact with on, a, on a, a, maybe an infrequent basis, but you still know those people, 150. And this is one of the reasons why churches are the size, of, size that they are. They, the congregation is usually 150 people. Anything bigger than that, and it's just... People can't interact with, with 300 people. It do, just doesn't work that way. Uh, but you can interact with smaller groups. And, that, and the optimum size seems to be 150. Although primates are highly social ma mammals in many ways, humans can be said to be ultra-social species. Humans uh, tend to be far more engaged with others around them than uh, do any other primates. We are constantly attending to what others are doing. We gossip about others all the time. Our behaviors are guided a great deal by what others around us are doing. We learn by imitating others. In an experiment by Dean et al. in 2012, the researchers compared the ability of a chimpanzee and orangutan versus a two-and-a-half-year-old to solve a physical problem and a social problem. The child and the great apes performed equally well on the physical problem at about 75%. So orangutans and chimpanzees 
and two and a half year old children could solve the physical problem fairly well. However, for the social problem, when the subjects had to follow a model, the two and a half year olds were more likely to follow precisely what the model did. The great apes tried to solve the social problem through emulation. Most of the humans scored 100% on the social problem, while most of the apes scored 0%. So no matter how reclusive an individual or a group of humans are, culture and the biology of the human brain are bound inextricably. Humans evolved to be a cultural species. Da, 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 da. And that is the end of the chapter. And that is the end of the lecture. So next week we'll tackle, tackle something else. Uh, talk to you next week.